Our next speaker is Jeff Cordell, um, who is speaking about driverless cars in the Australian automotive industry. I'm going to read this, I'm sorry, Jeff, it's a very long job title. <laughs> Jeff is the Executive Director of Graduate Transportation Design at the Pasadena Arts Centre College of Design. So we're very, very pleased to have him here today to speak to us. Just I'm just waiting for a presentation to come up. I've got a housekeeping matter from my cocktail party last night. Someone left their black umbrella. Oh, excellent. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh, I'm really happy to be back in Melbourne, albeit several decades after my own brief uh, participation in the automotive or the Australian automotive industry. And I'm, I'm really uh, feel very lucky to be part of this inaugural uh, AHA conference, which is nothing like being part of history, I think. Um, so my uh, presentation is going to uh, briefly explain what the trends are that are affecting the global industry, the automotive industry at the moment. Uh, just talk a little bit about why that is relevant to the Australian automotive industry. Uh, then I'm going to explain, this is where my hypothesis starts, uh, what I believe, uh, based on what's happening now, is a plausible way of regenerating, rebirthing, if you like, an automotive and vehicle industry in Australia. And then I would like to explain from a consumer's point of view what that would mean to us, this new uh, transportation future. Um, I'm going to have to gloss over a lot of the details during my paper because of the constraints of time, but hopefully you can hang on to my coattails as I go through this presentation. So uh, there are some major disruptions going on at the moment in the global automotive industry, which uh, are really ending what is effectively a 100-year hegemony in the automotive industry, and I'm talking globally here. Um, there are definitely changes in attitudes about automobiles and cars, particularly amongst the er uh, emerging generations. Uh, we're seeing that the accident avoidance technologies that are coming into play in today's cars are basically the start of a glide path into uh, full automation of vehicles. Uh, these automated vehicles promise a, a significant reduction in uh, collisions, which means at that point we can start really rethinking our approach to safety in automobiles and the way we regulate vehicles on safety. Um, we are looking also at a, the start of a glide path towards more electric vehicles, um, and it would seem that electric vehicle platforms are going to mean a certain commoditization in the, uh, in the vehicle uh, industry, uh, as people really don't really care very much about how electric traction um, how that affects the brand of the vehicle. And uh, as we see these modularized platforms, uh, I foresee also that we are going towards perhaps more interchangeable superstructures or bodies uh, which go onto these, uh, these platforms. And maybe this will take us back full circle to the, the, um, what we've been talking about over the last two days, which is uh, separate chassis and a kind of coach building industry, which would be an interesting full circle. Um, also, there's no doubt that uh, some of the tech companies, some of the disruptor companies now in the vehicle and transportation mobility industry, such as Uber and Apple and Google, uh, they're looking at a lot more than just de uh, developing rideshare apps. They've got their eye on much bigger things. So if you uh, combine these uh, ride-hail enterprises uh, with the powerful technologies that are being developed, uh, some of them by these uh, disruptors, uh, we combine that with new manufacturing philosophies as well, then this really threatens the fundamental business model of today's car industry. Uh, as we go through these changes, uh, self-driving cars will be the real game changer uh, because when you get vehicles that can drive themselves, it presents a whole new economic model for the ride-hailing industry. So the big question is, can the legacy automobile industry uh, adapt itself fast enough to uh, actually survive uh, these, uh, these disruptive companies? 
uh, and uh, coexist alongside uh, new enterprises that have very, very different uh, understandings of uh, revenue, mar uh, revenue streams and, and profit margins. Um, and as this new paradigm plays out, uh, we are likely to see many individuals and families who decide to give up on the ownership of their vehicles and instead actually subscribe to mobility packages or what I would term as total mobility packages. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And many enterprises will end up now competing in our personal mobility industry. There will be the OEMs who do figure out how to change. Uh, there will be the new tech companies, some of which we've never even heard of yet. And then there will be other amalgams, perhaps, of ex-OEMs and uh, new tech companies and other vested interests. So how, would, how is this going to, uh, how is this future mobility scenario relating to Australia? Well, I think there are huge opportunities that will come out of um, a new uh, alignments and new collaborations amongst, um, amongst the automotive, existing automotive industry, albeit without the manufacturing side since Ford, GM and Toyota are pulling manufacturing out. So alliances between the powerful uh, Australian supply industry, uh, dealer networks who find their business uh, being undermined, uh, academia, etc. And most definitely, government has a, a strong role to play here. Uh, certainly, Australia has all the expertise uh, because of its long history as being an automobile producer. Uh, and there are also some uh, interesting government incentive programs that have been around for a little while, uh, which can help too. Um, so I'm going to explain now how this might work. Uh, and the key, I believe, to this transformation in the Australian industry would be to look at the regulatory environment with a view to allowing a new category of vehicle to exist. And uh, this vehicle would be what we call, could call a low-speed personal vehicle, which is cross between what the Americans call a neighborhood electric vehicle, which is basically a glorified golf cart for use in controlled environments, and a car as we know it today, uh, but it would be um, the role of this vehicle would be very much for urban and suburban uses uh, in uh, speed restricted areas, uh, 40 kilometers an hour being a good speed to choose. Uh, and although it would have some occupant protection because of the lower speed operations and um, less uh, a, a more even speed distribution on the whole traffic fleet. Uh, they would be significantly easier to manage, uh, to uh, manufacture, and certainly to design. And this is important. This is quite significant uh, part of what I'm going to be explaining. So here's where the hypothesis starts: how a new generation of automotive uh, Australian enterprise could be um, could be born. So. Let's suppose in 2017 the Australian government does create a legislation to allow for this new kind of low-speed low personal vehicle uh, and also make sure that there are blanket speed limits uh, uh, strictly enforced around urban and suburban streets. Uh, arterial roads and highways would be exempted from these, uh, from these speed restrictions, although the, I could foresee that there could be um, segregated lanes for the low-speed vehicles. Um, and the motivation for the Australian government to do this will be because they uh, want to see more uh, zero emissions uh, energy efficient vehicles on the uh, urban streets of Australia. Uh, it will also help to stimulate uh, local industries to participate in the manufacture of these vehicles and also to stimulate a really new approach to a kind of automotive mobility ecosystem. Um, as a result of these uh, legislative changes, it inspires a small startup company to be formed in Melbourne, uh, a designer and a couple of vehicle engineers who maybe uh, decide to leave Broadmeadows uh, operations, um, and a business, uh, a business planner from the same realm. Uh, they get seed funding from uh, the Automotive Diversification Program and the Next Generation Manufacturing Program. Uh, and this funding pays their wages, it pays the rent for the offices they need to uh, work out of, the equipment they need, and also to uh, build or have built a series of prototypes. Um, so they start off 
by uh, designing a, a simple battery electric vehicle on a, on a simple aluminium platform. Uh, they design a superstructure, which is uh, an enclosed superstructure, uh, which is designed to meet these new, uh, much easier, low-speed vehicle crash regulations. And of course, they use the CAD uh, and engineering tools that are familiar to them from their previous vacation. 2018, they uh, deliver three prototypes, uh, which they use for demonstration purposes to get the next round of private sector funding. Also, they use one of them to, uh, to do a demo demonstration crash test. Um, and as a result of that, a number of uh, companies uh, see a lot of opportunities to invest in this. Uh, they see opportunities as suppliers, and for instance, a commercial vehicle body constructor um, negotiates to build, uh, to build these vehicles by investing in their own production facilities to, to take that uh, project on. And a lot of other investors see the potential uh, for this vehicle as being a, a new kind of platform for operating new ride-sharing enterprises out of local mobility service providers, if you like. Um, this new round of funding allows the team to expand as they go into the production uh, cycle um, and also uh, increase their marketing team. And their marketing strategy includes uh, looking at public-private partnerships, for instance, to encourage maybe first and last mile uh, ride share operations, etc. Uh, the Australian Motor Corporation, uh, sorry, the Australian Mobility Corporation, as they become known by 2020, uh, they start speed, uh, they start rolling out these new uh, low speed vehicles, electric vehicles. There's a very positive public reaction to them. They're attracted, the public is attracted to the potential low running costs and purchase costs of these vehicles, uh, and to the point where a number of them realize that it's an appealing alternative to one of their existing household regular cars. Um, now uh, the AMC, Australian Mobility Corporation, starts to work with the government to assess what regulatory changes now need to be uh, uh, made to allow for driverless versions of these low-speed vehicles, low-speed driverless vehicles. Um, and they collaborate with uh, some of their uh, investors and suppliers to look at a whole range of vehicles based on this platform uh, using these, um, uh, looking at different applications in the urban and suburban environment. Uh, and they also do a lot of research with uh, local academia and some of their suppliers uh, and looking at the new kinds of manufacturing techniques which Mark was just talking about which would allow uh, for these vehicles not to be made in just one plant in Melbourne, say, but be to, to be distributed around the nation or even beyond on a, on a licensing basis. Um, in 2022, uh, AMC becomes a truly vertically integrated uh, car company, um, or I should say a mobility provider. So apart from uh, designing and uh, participating in the manufacture of the vehicles, it also has its sights set on being actually mobility service providers as well. So I'm going to talk a little about now what, uh, what this would mean for us as consumers of mobility in Australia. Um, so let's fast forward to 2028 and uh, we'll consider Keith and Jane who uh, live just up the road from here in Greensboro. Uh, they have two children, Katie and Paul, who go to a local school in Greensboro. Jane is a school inspector, so it means uh, some days of the week she has to work from her department in the, the central district of Melbourne, and other days she has to go and visit various schools in and around Melbourne. Uh, and Keith is a design consultant who works out of his own studio a couple of miles from where they live. Uh, he has uh, quite a few clients in the Melbourne area, and he has a couple of significant clients in Sydney. Um, they both subscribe to the Australian Mobility Corporation's total mobility package. Uh, this means that, in fact, uh, this total mobility package essentially looks after uh, all of their travel needs. And uh, they have uh, this family account, and part of this family account includes a virtual concierge, which is available 24-7, uh, 
and they call that concierge Jane. Uh, and they decided some years ago they no longer used their own vehicle, so they sold it. Uh, so it's a Monday morning, and uh, Jane has to attend her weekly meeting at a department on Collins Street. Uh, James knows her routine off already. She confirms a pickup at 8.15 the next morning, uh, on the Monday morning by uh, reminding her on the Sunday evening and again reminds her 15 minutes before the vehicle arrives. And sure enough, a small one plus one urban runabout arrives on time. Uh, it recognizes Jane through uh, facial recognition and at that point uh, it shows up a little sign that greets her on the outside to confirm that it's her car for this morning. Uh, and also uh, the door handle lights up to indicate that the doors are now unlocked. And as she uh, gets into the car and puts her seatbelt on, she, um, she interacts with James again, who confirms her destination. Uh, a few minutes later, the car drops her off at uh, Greensboro Station. Uh, James tells her that she only has four minutes to wait for the next train. And sure enough, uh, a little while later, she arrives at Flinders Street, uh, which is a short walk from her office. Meanwhile, Katie and Paul have to go to school and uh, at about the same time as um, Jane leaves, uh, an automated school shuttle arrives. And again, it recognizes the children through facial recognition. The doors open, the children get on, and off they go to school. This is not actually supplied, uh, provided by AMC. This is another uh, operator who is contracted to the school district. And the beauty of these shuttles is after the school runs are over in the morning and the afternoon, they can be used for other um, community work, such as ferrying seniors to the supermarket or to doctor's appointments, etc. Um, today, uh, Keith is uh, cycling to his studio. He's got to prepare for uh, a business meeting tomorrow. Uh, he rides on an electric bicycle provided by AMC. Uh, meanwhile, Jane's Monday morning meeting is finished. She decides to wait uh, to work a little longer on, um, uh, at her office and then uh, informs James that she's going to catch the 4.30 train back from Flinders Street. She needs a pickup from Greensboro Station, and she will be detouring to do some shopping on the way home. James confirms all this, and sure enough, when she arrives at Greensboro Station, there is one of quite a few uh, urban runabouts um, and uh, collecting people off the train. Uh, Jane is identified. Uh, Jane identifies her car, and... Um, Basically, the car allows her to go to the local shopping mall, and uh, when her errands are completed, she arrives back at her home and gets out. Now, Jane happens to be a fastidious person, so she leaves the vehicle spotless, but there's the question of what would happen if she was actually a rather messy person and had left uh, maybe ice cream stains on the seats or um, uh, potato chips on the seat. So the vehicle would have uh, smart, be built out of smart materials, which will understand whether it needs to go to be valid, valid and, um, or valet, depending on which country you come from. And um, the service, if it had to get a wash and brush up, uh, would actually uh, consume some mobility credits from their total mobility package, so there's an incentive. Um, Keith cycles home in time for the kids returning from school, um, but Tuesday morning is slightly different. Uh, Jane has two visits to uh, different schools in Melbourne, and Keith has a business trip to Sydney, which includes a 7 a.m. flight from Melbourne. Uh, and the trip, the whole trip, uh, both in the Melbourne end and in Sydney, is arranged and orchestrated by AMC. Uh, I'm going to skip the details and based on, in, in the name of time. Uh, but sure enough, again, in the, uh, in the morning, uh, after reminders, a courtesy car picks him up, takes him to the airport, and actually he gets into the airport through AMC's own security uh, portal, uh, and, it's, uh, and he is ascribed um, an AMC seat on the airplane. Uh, meanwhile, kids go to school as usual. Uh, Jane has her door-to-door -door services uh, to her school visits because there are no, actually, uh, no actual convenient transit lines to the first school in Doncaster East. Uh, um, and similarly, when she's finished there, to get to uh, St. Bernard's Primary near Coburg, there is not, not good transit there either. So it's best for her to have the urban runabout service to take between these appointments. And sure enough, uh, 
On her way home, there is good transit from Coburg back to Greensboro, and so she chooses to use that because it uses a lot, of, uh, a lot less mobility credits from their account. So that's a very brief um, overview of what a total mobility package would look like in this new Australian automotive uh, industry. Um, it's hypothetical, but I think it's based on a lot of trends which are actually happening now that we're seeing. Um, it would leverage significant current Australian assets that we have in the automotive industry. Uh, and at the same time, it no longer has to rely on overseas corporations to deliver either. Um, I think it's very urban, uh, sorry, very relevant to urban situations uh, and suburban situations. And I think there is an opportunity to greatly increase the quality of people's lives. Uh, it's less clear to me, having gone through the process of writing this paper and my other work, uh, academic work on this, it's less clear to me whether this automation is so appropriate or practical for people who live out in the rural areas, but that's a whole other discussion and another paper for a later time. So thank you very much, and if you uh, have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. talk, it's very interesting for me too, working for RACV, which was just got a new CEO, and a couple of weeks ago he gave our uh, entire staff a presentation, and one of the key um, elements of it was how could RACV position itself in the near future to have a part in this sort of uh, mobility arrangement. So if any engineers have the ideas for the startup, you've probably got a financial backer already waiting for you to do it. <laughs> any questions? Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I've got a question in relation to, uh, I guess, the where this might take us. So, so Renault have been extraordinarily interested in your uh, scenario, and so they thought they'd test this out by building the Twizy, which, which we're seeing quite extensively used in a wide range of European cities, particularly in, in France and Italy, and it does. It, it is a real attempt to address some of the issues, not all of them. And it looks like it's a vehicle that can, in fact, be um, uh, additively manufactured in a distributed system. A lot of it is. But do you feel, looking at that as as a large-scale prototype, a testing of some of the components of your scenario, is that telling us anything about either the use of smaller vehicles or the way in which those kinds of vehicles change on-road behaviour uh, in a way which feeds into the sort of broader picture of people using the vehicles. And there's a series of assumptions in your scenarios. Certain kinds of, there are, that people are being very functional about how they're using these vehicles. And there's something, there's kind of, there's quite strong legacy issues going on in your scenarios. Mm -hmm. that, that I'm just wondering if there are, there's going to be room for some fairly serious unforeseen disruption also entering into this picture. Yeah, I, 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 that's, that's a really good question. Uh, so the, the emphasis in my presentation on the small vehicles is a stepping stone because I think, as I said before, the real game changer is the self-driving nature. And um, the other aspect of the smaller vehicles is that, you know, for in most metropolises, 85% of people drive by themselves and yet we drive around carrying around spare seats. We all, we all know that, that, that theory. So. Um, the point being that in this scenario of a total mobility package, you get exactly the kind of vehicle that you would need. When it, com when it comes to addressing, say, driver behaviors with different kinds of vehicles, um, that's where the driverless uh, technology will help in the long run because uh, vehicles will drive collaboratively rather than combatively as we do as human beings. So it starts to address some of these behavioral problems. Now, I don't underestimate that there are a lot of, um, th th there's a lot of, uh, uh, as you say, the, the behavioral legacy, if you like, in drivers as well. Uh, I just happen to believe that when this sort of technology actually gets beyond the beta testing phase, uh, that I think people are going to adapt pretty fast when they understand the benefits that this kind of thing can bring. So I, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but, uh, but the, the, the Twizy is a, was a very, is a brave attempt to try and 
uh, carve out this niche vehicle to, to get something going. And, um, but it does require legislative uh, support. That, that's the thing. I mean, the, we can't drive vehicles like that on the roads here yet, and certainly not in the US, although it's talked a lot about. Can I uh, just ask you if you, you might consider taking that whole scenario logically another step forward? Um, something I've thought about a lot over the years in, in how mass transport systems could change totally where you wouldn't bother even to go to the train. But these, you have modular or podular vehicles that transport you from locally, and this has always been the greatest benefit of the car. You can use it to go exactly where you want to. And you could do that with this scenario, but when you want to go long distance or into the city, you actually join a pod line, if you like, that, that the driverless system takes you to that pod line, you, you go with everyone else, you're all going the same speed, you're all going in the same direction, there's no more accident problem and you've got crash avoidance anyway, and you peel off where you want to and keep going. And for that reason, I've often argued that we should, even in this day and age, <coughs> excuse me, we should be still uh, designing elaborate freeway networks everywhere that will actually provide the corridors for our current type of vehicles, but in the future, give you the avenues already in place so that no matter what form this mass transport system takes, it can use that corridor and you add to it however you need to. Um, I have thought a lot about it. And I have to be very careful where I say this, but I, I, I can argue for the fact that the future of mass transit will be the automobile. Um, I'm not an apologist for the automobile industry by any means. I'm kind of agnostic about transportation modes. But um, actually, if people are making their journeys in, in a vehicle which is precisely matched to their needs and therefore energy efficient, uh, the, a case can be made that it's far more efficient than 40 people uh, riding around in a 500 ton train. Um, so, and of course, you do have the flexibility. But um, yes, as regarding infrastructure, we, we live in a world, well certainly in the Western world, where there is very little political or economic will to build new infrastructure. So I think what we have to do is to make sure that we use our existing infrastructure a lot more efficiently than we can now. And again, the, the automated vehicle, because of its more uh, collaborative uh, driving habits, uh, has a great opportunity to do that. Uh, but, but, but we should talk more about that because I think there, I think there is some definite, the, the idea can be extended a lot further than I've just explained. Uh, thank you very much. I've got a question in relation to an evaluation of all the costs uh, that this uh, might have, uh, uh, might take, uh, including, for instance, uh, the fact that a lot of uh, taxi drivers uh, for, uh, will lose uh, all their jobs, uh, and also in relation to the fact that uh, one of the uh, good thing of uh, having something driveless is that you can use that time in order to do something else. In here, for instance, uh, uh, because the car doesn't pertain to the family, they have uh, to wait, uh, so to book the car and wait. And, and so they are in some way wasting their time waiting. And at the same time, uh, when they are using the car, you need, uh, well, I think that the, the benefit of drive, uh, driverless is related to the fact that during the trip uh, you're not just observing the landscape, uh, you are doing something related to your work or related to something else. And even that factor should be factorized, according to me, in a cost-benefit analysis. So I was wondering if a cost-benefit analysis had been done considering extensively cost and benefit of a project like this. Um, I haven't done such a cost benefit analysis. Um, <clears throat> your, your first part of your question, which is about, uh, for instance, taxi drivers who lose their jobs, uh, that's a whole other discussion, I think, connected with automation generally. It's a big societal, quest societal question, which we need to ask uh, about how uh, people who do lose their existing jobs can get, um, can get um, appropriately redeployed. Um, if we look at the bigger picture of what I've just talked about, actually the, 
there are, there, are, there are a lot of opportunities for businesses who are going to be threatened by this scenario to actually participate in the new one. And a, an obvious example would be dealers, uh, vehicle dealers. If we're, if we're not buying cars anymore, uh, we don't need dealers. But on the other hand, that valeting uh, situation, uh, these vehicles that are running 24-7, uh, they are going to need regular maintenance and checkups and cleaning. And so I could see the future of dealers actually being the service agents for the different brands that run these op operations for, uh, all, all over all over the metropolis. For instance, excuse me. Yeah, the, the yeah. So there are. It, it's interesting to uh, your question is interesting because it, it, it's certainly a lot of um, economic. Uh, studies need to be made about where these opportunities are. Um, I can't predict how it will turn out at the moment, but uh, uh, I think that we're a pretty adaptive species, so as these technologies roll out, I think people are going to be fairly fast to see where there are, where there are business opportunities. Hey, thanks, Jeff. That was awesome. Um, got two questions. The, the, First one, well, I, the, the, in terms of this already starting up, well, there, there is um, one of those open source tabby platforms. I know there's one in, in Melbourne right now, and somebody is actually working on developing that. And one of the, one of the um, embodiments of that is actually a networked vehicle, and there's, there's a group of people overseas who are working on that at the moment too. So the, this platform's here. People are working on it. The government still hasn't, um, and I, I think the, the regulation is the L6E, is it L6E? Mm -hmm. For um, low speed electric vehicles um, up to 40 kilometers an hour. Um, what, what role does the government play as a strategic um, thing, or a strategic move to enable these? And what role do you see the tactical, everyday startup, like Uber-esque type, um, application of these things, and how can we kind of mediate between those two? I guess this is more than two questions, isn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, how can we med mediate between those two, but then also prototype it so that we don't end up where, we, where we've ended up now? Um, so I think there is a, uh, I think there is a role for, uh, uh, for, for the uh, product development community in the automobile industry, designers and engineers, um, need to uh, need to roll their sleeves up a bit, and if they're interested in developing this kind of scenario, of actually uh, being uh, willing to work with the respective government agencies that are responsible for the regulators. Uh, certainly, it's been interesting for me as I've attended a lot of industry and um, and uh, government uh, workshops and conferences on the future of automated vehicles. That there is a there are plenty of technologists, there are plenty of risk management people, there are plenty of uh, policy makers, there are all sorts of people. The, the one group that's always missing actually is the design community, and they need to be they need to be very much part of this uh, this conversation to, to get it to get it to move forward. Uh, but government does have a does have a an opportunity to if they if they want to see this happen uh, for economic reasons. They, they need to uh, intelligently work to uh, change the legislation to allow it to happen. Thank you so much, Jeff. Please uh, join me in thanking Jeff for his